All right, good morning, everyone. Welcome back to Data Programming One. All right, as we get started today, there is a template available on our webpage. It's a Jupyter Notebook that you guys can go download and use that as a guide as you take notes. And there are some examples in there. I'll be pulling it up myself in just a moment. Also, we'll be using Python Tutor. So as I'm go going through with uh, the introduction here, you can uh, go ahead and get that opened up so it's ready to go also. Quick reminder, we have an exam scheduled for next Wednesday, November 4th. That's one week from today, assuming you're watching this video on schedule. Uh, if you're watching the video late, it's not a week from today. If you're late, it'll be Wednesday. Um, there'll be an email coming soon with uh, all the information you need about exact timing, when you can take the exam, the format, how it's going to work. Uh, very similar to the last exam. Okay, I'm going to jump over to that Jupyter Notebook and do the very first example. So give me one second to set that up. All right, so um, over the last two lectures, well, there's a sequence of three lectures. This is the third where we're talking about advanced functions or advanced techniques with functions. The first was recursion. Then we talked about functions as objects. And today we're going to be talking about generators. But let's start out with a little review. I've got two functions here, example one and example two. Uh, example one is a function called mystery. That's a terrible name for a function. Do not name your functions mystery. Give them meaningful names. And then the other one is raise 10. One of these is an example of recursive function, and the other one is an example of a function object reference. Uh, go ahead, uh, take a look at this code, see if you can figure out which one is which. And then uh, go ahead, make your guess commit to it. There's some little boxes there. Uh, I deleted them so I could put them right next to each other on this slide. Go ahead and write down what you think the answer is. All right. If you said that mystery is the recursive function, that's weird the way it's jumping around. Okay. Um, you'd be correct. So if you remember, a recursive function is just going to be a function that calls itself. So here's the name of my function, mystery, inside of the function, right here on the return line, I am calling the function mystery. All right, and the other example, um, if we have a function like raise 10, uh, a function reference is gonna be created where we use the raise 10 without the parentheses. So we can see right here, we are using raise 10 as a function object and passing it to the map function. All right, I wanna just go through a little bit more um, and see if we can talk a little bit ab about figuring out what recursive functions do. We, we did this uh, two lectures ago where we did this in reverse, where we had a problem and we went through those four steps to turn a problem into a recursive Python function. In this case, let's take a look at this and see if we can figure out what this function really does. And we're going to do this by just exploring a little bit. So let's just start out by calling the function with some really simple arguments. So we'll do, whoops, mystery. And then we'll call this with mystery21 and see what this does. Oh, I didn't run the cell. I just opened the notebook. It's a fresh notebook. There we go. So you have to run cell, in this case, two in order to bring in the code so Python knows where to find it. And then when I ran this cell, mystery21, it went ahead and did this uh, uh, function call to run the code. So here we're passing in 2 to x, 1 to y, and I picked 1 because if y is equal to 1, it's just going to return x. This is the base case. Remember, I'm always going to have some kind of conditional. It could be an if, it could be a while, it could be some other loop. Um, so that there is a base case that's going to end that recursion and then the recursive part. All right, so in this case, uh, this is the base case. So I'm just returning x, which is 2 in this case. And another cell. Come on. Mystery. Let's try 2, 2 this time. That way we'll go into the recursive case. So we'll run. There we go. I had messed with the uh, type of cell it was right there with some sort of like fumbling on the keys. Mr. Fumblefinger has made his appearance. Okay, so now we can see that uh, when we call, if y is equal to 1, we'll return it's not. In this case, I'm calling with y is equal to 2. So now what we're going to do is we're going to turn x times mystery of x with y minus 1. Well, this right here, this mystery x of y minus 1 is exactly what we just did right here. Mystery x was 2, x is still 2, y is 1, 
2 minus 1 is 1. That's uh, kind of why it shows this is my second example. This right here we've already done. So this is just going to return x, which is 2, times this piece right here, which is 2. And so that's 2 times 2 is going to be 4. All right, let me just do one more of these. We'll get one more cell below. Mystery 2, 3. We'll run this cell. We get 8 this time. And again, the same sort of logic follows. So it's if y is 1, it's not. We skip down and we're going to turn x, which is 2, times mystery of 2. And then 3 minus 1 is 2, which is exactly what I've got right here. Mystery 2, 2. And that was 4. So this is going to be a 2 times 4. Maybe I'll just write this out in a little comment right here. Returning 2 times and then 2, and then 3 minus 1 is that 2 that we had right there. Okay, uh, so that's kind of a, kind of what we're doing here, is looking for the pattern, figuring out, you know, rather than actually using my brain to go and step through everything, I've already got the piece of information that I need right here. And I can see that what this function is really doing at the end, well, I mean another cell, is taking x and raising it to the y power. And in Python, that to raise to a power is the double multiplication. So not every programming language has exponentiation built into it. Python is, is lucky that it does. So we're going to take advantage of that notation right here. So uh, just to verify this, 2 raised to the 3 should give me 8. There it is, 8. All right, very good. All right, my second review example um, is an example of a function object or a, a reference to a function. So here's what I'm doing. I've got a function here, uh, raise 10, and I'm using my mystery function from up above. So this may have been a little tricky if you thought, ooh, maybe do I have a circular reference? Does mystery actually call raise 10? Then we would have had recursion here also. But no, in this case, it's just gonna call mystery once. It happens to be recursive, so we'll do whatever uh, this function call does and return that. Okay, so the mystery function is recursive, not the raise 10. Um, but here's where that function uh, object comes in. We're calling raise 10 right here. But we're not, oh, I'm sorry, we are not calling raise 10. We are passing the function. So this, when I run this code, creates a function object with uh, a variable raise 10 that points to that object. Okay, and I can pass that function object to other functions. In this case, the map is uh, the equivalent of the do this to everything in the list. Oh, I forget what I called it last time. Um, uh, do for each or apply to each, something like that. I'm totally blanking on whatever I named it. But what this is going to do is it's going to take this list of numbers and apply this function to that list of numbers. Uh, this is going to return a map object that we can convert to a list. And we'll talk a little bit more about uh, the type of object that is, this is and that lets us just turn things into lists. So. Um, at the end of the lecture today. So when we run this code, what we see is that it's going to return a list, and what we're doing is we're applying raise 10 first to this one to give us that number, then to this one to give us that. All right, so let me just, uh, let's just do one of these. Raise 10 with a 1 right there. So raise 10. Uh, gives us 10, which was the first number right here. When we call mystery 10 with 1, remember that mystery is going to do 10 raised to the 1 power, or just give us 10. When we do the second one there, raise 10 with a 3 in it, run this cell. I did that again. It switched to the weird mode. Okay, so when that happens, you guys, switch it back to code right here, and then you can run it. I don't know what I fumbled to switch the, the mode on these things. Okay, so raise 10, 3 is going to be doing 10 raised to the third power, or 10 times 10 times 10, which is 1,000. Okay. All right, now on to the new material. So here's the plan for today. We're going to be talking about iterators and generators, uh, mostly generators at the beginning. Um, these are going to be functions that have the keyword yield in them. We'll talk about some vocabulary uh, and then probably move those to next lecture. 
But here's the plan. Uh, let's start out with just a normal function and give this some thought. So let's take a look at this. Uh, we're going to define get one digit nums. It's going to um, bank a list of the numbers 0 through 9. That's the goal. All right, all right, we're going to start out by printing start, empty list, and then we've got a while loop here, the most versatile of all loops. For i is 0, i less than 10, nums.append, so it's going to append 0, then it's going to append 1, then 2. Uh, there's our increment step all the way up to 9. Uh, after it's appended 9, this will be 10. It's no longer less than, it's equal to, so it'll jump out of the loop and then we return that list. Um, here we're just uh, defining the function, and then here we're using the function. And we're using the function in a for statement. So I've got for x in, and then I've got my function call right here. And I'm just going to print out x. Okay, so the question to get us started is, how many times is the word start really printed? Is this function called every single time we go through the loop? For x, it's going to get something, and then we do something, and then x gets updated. Or is this just called once? And the answer is start only appears once. When we call this function, it returns a list, this list of nums right there. And essentially what you can imagine is this is a simplification. I'm taking a function call and replacing it with this list. And I can totally do this. I can just give x, uh, or a for statement, a list. So for x in this list, so x will become the first element of the list. We'll print it out. Then it'll become the second element in the list. We printed out the third element, and so on. So start is only printed once. Um, think about this as a simplification. Um, now it's doing essentially all of the work all at once. So I've got my black box up here, that's the function. It's going to do all of this work uh, in stage one, basically just preparing that list of numbers 0 through 9. And then once we've got that list, it's going to replace it right here. Then we do all of the work in this gray box. So we we run get nums, get one digit nums code, and then we're going to loop over the results in print in stage two, the gray box. All right, so that's that's exactly what's going on. This is not a generator yet. This is just uh, regular Python code like we've been working with all semester so far. All right, now let's take a look at this. This one's a little different. It's subtly different. Um, here we're going to be printing out prime numbers. That's the goal. We're going to assume that we have access to an is prime function. It's uh, on the previous uh, well, a couple lectures back we made one of those. So let's assume that it's there. And this one's just going to put together a list of prime numbers and return that. That's the goal. So we print out start. We create our empty list. Uh, while i is, equal, uh, i is 0, while true, we're going to just call is prime. If it's true, if that is prime, we'll stick it on the list. So I'm creating a list of prime numbers, and then we test the next one. All right, when we get through that list, uh, that loop, uh, we print out end, and we'll return nums. And then we'll go ahead and use that. It gets replaced right there, and we'll print out x. Uh, so this is going to print out all the prime numbers. There is a little problem right here, though. Um, this isn't going to work for us because we have an infinite loop right here. Well, true. There is no condition that will ever get us out of this loop. It's just going to continue to make a longer and longer list of prime numbers until uh, my computer runs out of memory. Um, and that's not going to happen for a very long time. I've got a lot of memory. And finding prime numbers, once you get past the easy ones, is not super fast. So what I really like to do is create a function, my get primes here, that I can call like this same way I've been doing with other lists where I get a prime number just one that's all I need and then I call my code that prints it out then we'll get the next one and then we'll print it out and we'll get the third one and we'll print that out and we just do this forever we want a function here that I can sort of run a little bit get some data out of it run a little more get some data out run a little more get some more data out so let's see I think I've got like captions here all right, so uh, we get primes just long enough to get one. Yeah, this is known as a lazy function, as opposed to eager that would try and do all of the work. Like, all functions are normal. The normal ones like this, generators, uh, we can think of them as lazy. They're just going to go and uh, execute until they get to the yield statement. And then they, they take a break. Okay, we print one number, then we resume, get the next number. All right, so, and we will stop 
uh, running and resuming get primes many times, but we're only going to call this function once. That's the idea behind a generator. Um, there we go. Behavior called generators. All right. So, uh, and I think I, I don't remember if I mentioned now, but here the definition of a generator is any function that contains the word yield anywhere in it. The yield keyword is a lot like return. So a return is going to just take whatever value that is and give it back to the uh, caller of the function. Yield's going to do the same thing. It's going to give the value back to the caller, but and then it just sort of pauses the execution um, until that function is called again um, or used again. Um, I'll show you how to use it in, again, bring that back uh, in a moment. But um, this is really going to change how functions behave. So, and we'll go through a bunch of examples to just explore this. All right. There is um, some uh, discussion in the Python community or in uh, programming language community if generators are even, you know, should they even be called functions? Because they are really so different, but they, they look so similar. So that decision is made by uh, Guido Van Rossum up until recently, who was Python's benevolent dictator for life. And the way things work, um, when the community has a discussion about like, should we introduce another keyword? Should we say instead of using def, for a function definition, should we call this gen for uh, generator creation? Um, it does produce a generator object. It's very different how it works. Um, and this is the guy who makes a decision. So the way this works is he listens to all the discussion and then says, okay, here's the argument for calling this generator. A yield st statement hidden somewhere in the body is not enough warning that the semantics are different. Okay, and then an argument in defense generators of functions but with a tiny twist that they're resumable so he, he listens to both arguments and then makes a pronouncement and says yeah generators as functions but with a twist that they're resumable so it's up to him and I, I think you'll find that in a lot of programming languages the developers are reluctant to add more keywords because it uh, takes away from the number of variables that you can use and adding a new keyword at some point might make older code not run. If I use gen as a variable at any point in older code and then they go ahead and say, oh, well, gen is now a, a keyword, that's going to make all of my old code not work with the new version of Python. So we'll always scan a function for yields uh, when we try and understand it. Uh, very important for next week on the exam. All right, so next up, I want to just come up with a much simpler example than the prime number one and go through and talk about how yield works, and we'll come back to things that are a little more complicated. So I'm going to do this in Python Tutor. Uh, one little caveat here, uh, Python Tutor does not do a good job of showing generators. In fact, it hides some information from us that's really important to understanding. I, I understand why they did it when they developed Python Tutor, but it's, it's, it's a good tool to learn this, we'll see how it works. It'll demonstrate it. it gives us the best picture we can get, but it's not perfect. So let me uh, walk through that with you guys. One second while I pull that up. All right, so I'm gonna start out by just defining a function. Define f, generic function. Uh, this is just gonna return one, return two, return three. And then we'll call this a bunch of times. So print out f, print f, print f and then as we go through this here let's go back to the beginning do first step uh, then next we create a function object give it the name uh, create a variable here f had, that refers to that function object then we will print this stuff so it's going to go ahead and simplify this function call f here and then print that out so we jump into the function uh, we go down we see that it returns one this prepares the return value and then returns that to print, which prints it out. All right, next, basically the same thing. We simplify this. We go back into the function, um, prepare the return value when we get to that very first return statement, and print that out. And then I'm just going to click last to get to the end. We see that it prints out one three times. Once we hit the return statement, everything else beyond that is dead code that will never be executed. All right, so I just wanted to walk through this real quick as an introduction, and I want to update this now to put in yield to turn f from a function 
into a generator object and comment on the differences. So we'll have yield here. Let me copy and paste this. Go back to first. Okay, so here's what's going on now. So instead of creating a function object, we see when we define f now, it's actually giving us, over here it's telling us it's a function. Uh, this is a generator object at this point. So this is one of those places where a Python tutor is a little misleading. Uh, generator object. Um, it's, it's classifying all those, just lumping them into one thing. Anything with def, Python tutor is going to call a function. All right, now when we print it out, it goes here. Um, this function call, I'm using my little air quotes here. I know you can't see it. If this were a real classroom, that would be great. Uh, is actually creating um, this generator object. And when we go up here and print that out, it's actually saying generator object f at some memory address. That ox, the hexadecimal is a clue that that's a memory address. Uh, I suppose add is also. But um, so it's, it's actually, uh, we're not using this correctly to actually get out the one, two, and three. So I'm going to update this right here. Instead of printing out generator object over and over and over, what we're going to use is for x in f, print x. Okay, all right, let's start this over first. Uh, create the generator object. And now when we have a generator object, uh, we can use that to get values out. So the first time through, um, right, so I just executed line six. It's now creating the generator object, f. And here it's going to go in. X is going to be whatever this function is preparing. So it's going to go ahead, find a return value. It should really be yield value. Um, it's not a function that returns something for yielding. And it's going to send this one back and put it into X. And then there it is. One is now stored in X. We'll print that out. There it is up there in the output box. Okay, then the next time through the loop, we'll go ahead and say, all right, function here, generator. Uh, the generator is going to just resume where it left off. So it had just yielded one. So it's going to resume at the next line down. When we get up here, we need the next value to store at x. So we go back to the generator and say, all right, pick up where you left off. Uh, right there on yield one, the next line to execute is yield two. So it's going to do that. Prepares a return value of two in this case, or a yield value. Uh, and then it's going to stick that two into the variable x, and we'll print that out. All right. So over here, we've got the global frame. We can still see we still have an f. That's a generator object. We still have x. We just printed that out. We're getting the next value for x now. So we jump back into the frame for the generator. Uh, we resume right after yield 2. This is the right there. Code to be executed is uh, yield 3 next. Prepares a return value. Goes ahead and puts that into x. Prints it out. And then, um, so the next thing that happens, um, it's going to go through one more time, of course, and try and get the next value, uh, which is, in this case, nothing. We've reached the end of the function, or we're at the end of the generator. And so it's going to return none. And that's how Python Tutor, uh, or Python, I'm sorry, knows that we need to exit this loop. We've now finished and move on with the rest of the code. Uh, here we're getting this message, uh, stop iteration. Uh, I know it, it looks like a big scary um, error message, and technically it is an error message. Uh, we'll be talking more about this kind of error message in the future uh, when we talk about um, exceptions. So this is a, an example of something that's coming up. But So you can ignore this for now. Stop iteration just means we've reached the last yield in a function. All right, so I want to just simplify this a little bit more. Um, essentially putting a generator right here. I'm just going to delete this. Is uh, With this generator, the same thing as doing something like this. We put in 1, 2, 3, and now x is going to go grab the first value from this list. If I just, uh, well, it's already done. It's executed. It's already printing out 1, 2, 3. Um, that's exactly what this is doing, except the generator is going to go get each value one at a time. What this means is that I can have an arbitrarily, you know, a potentially infinite number of things that this can return without having to worry about the actual creation of a list that will never actually finish being made. You know, I can just uh, 
get the first some arbitrary number of items out of a, a list like this with the generator. Okay, um, let me put this back as the generator version. And I want to add a, a couple more details here. Print, we'll print out an A. Um, we'll go ahead, we'll print out, not where I wanted that. A, except I want A, B, and C. So this should give us a little more depth of understanding as to what's going on when we call this. So let me just real quick, uh, hopefully this will make a little more sense if the first example, the first walkthrough didn't. All right, let me go back to the beginning. Let's go to first. So I'm creating um, the generator object in line one. Then I'm going to loop through and grab pieces of data from the generator object. So X is going to get the first piece. As we go through, this function can do all kinds of stuff. It doesn't just have to yield numbers. Uh, so first thing it's going to do is print out A. Then we hit that yield line, and it's going to return 1, put it in X, and line 11 will print that out. Okay, then we jump back through. We need to get the next X out of the generator, so pop back in the generator. Over here, each one of these generator objects, F is going to refer to a generator. This is, uh, so normal function, we just have a bunch of code there. Generator object has the same code, but it also needs to keep track of where did I leave off. So there's some extra meta information about you know what's the next line that's going to be executed. Not a lot of extra information, just you know what are the values of all the local parameters and the next line to be executed. So essentially it's a snapshot of the stack frame that I can bring back. Okay. Um, yep, so we just yielded one. We're grabbing the next value of x. So when I click next, uh, it's going to go through whatever code until it hits the next yield in this case. It's going to print out B, then it's going to hit that yield to prepare that as a return value. That return value is going to go into X, and then um, we'll print out X inside the loop on line 11. Cool. Uh, then just to be complete, um, when this stopped running there, it's just paused. They saved the stack frame with all the local variables. Um, the address of the, or the next line to be executed. Remember all that stuff. All right, so when we go through and get the next X out of the generator to print out. Um, we jump down, we're going to print out C, executes whatever code, then hits that yield 3, and comes up with a return value of 3, puts that in X, we'll print that out. All right, and then we've reached the end, it returns none, and we're done. I am just a little curious. I haven't tried this myself yet. Uh, what happens if we do this yeah so okay it does work it will print out the D and then it gets to none and will not print out anything for X it's gonna exit this for loop so it did more work after the very last call so this this generator is examined four times so we got A B C and D ever from the calls to the generator all right I'm gonna make this a, a, a little bit different of an example to demonstrate uh, multiple generators. All right, Let's just go ahead and change this a little bit. I'm going to get rid of these extra lines that I'm printing stuff out. I don't need those. And what I want to do here is actually create a second loop. So we've got for x in f, and then inside of that loop we're going to do for y in f, and then we'll just print out x, y. Okay. All right, so I just ran this to the very last piece, and here's the complete output of the entire code. So it's going to print 1, 1 for x and y, and then 1, 2, 1, 3. It's giving us every single possible combination of numbers. So what it's doing here, uh, let me just go back to the very beginning and we'll walk through this. So first, it's uh, going to remember this generator code, um, keep track of where f is, and then when we go through and do line 8 for x in f, it's going to go ahead and grab the first value from this generator. So uh, we're jumping into the frame for f. It's going to get a return value, and it's going to return that to x. So now x is equal to 1. Then, uh, and this is a really, um, in my opinion, big flaw of Python Tutor. It's not showing us that these are different. So I'm creating a second generator right here. Um, so when I call f, 
That's what's creating the generator object. I'm getting a separate one every time I have f with parentheses following it. Okay, and I'm getting a value for that. And this is a completely separate, different one. It's not going to go get the two. It's getting there's like the first generator up here is returning things for x. I've got another one down here that's returning things for y. So it's going to go start from the beginning because this is a separate generator object. Uh, yield 1 and return that to y and then I've got x is 1 y is 1 it's going to print that out okay next time through that loop we've got this inner loop we're going back to the second generator the one from the for y and x for, for y in f it's going to go through it's going to pick up right where it left off and jump down to the yield 2 return that let's stick that value in y and then it's going to print out 1 2 and then it's going to go through this inner loop one more time. It goes back to the generator, says, I need another value for y. It says, sure, how about 3? There it is, return value 3. Um, returns that to y, and then we'll print out 1, 3. Now, we've finished here. Let me just click a couple times because it's going to return none. That means we've finished this inner loop. So now we go back. The next line is getting the next value. Yep, there it is, stop iteration. Big scary message just means, okay, move on, next line of code, which happens to be back to this one. All right, now we're going back to the first generator. They're all labeled F. It doesn't show that they're separate objects over here. It just shows the one. So anyway, uh, a little more confusing than it needs to be because they're they're hiding information from us. They're not showing us that they're separate generators. Uh, I've, got a, I've, got, I've got a better idea for an example that I'll show that. We'll do that in a second but let me just walk through a little bit more of this code it says go back this um generator generator object needs to resume go ahead and figure out the next value to return to x uh so we've already gotten the one out that's where these three ones in the left column came from it's now going to yield two so it returns a two to x and now it's going to run that inner code so uh, for y is equal for y in f uh, goes back. This is a new generator object, so it's going to go and start over at one. So that first one completed. We now have another one from this uh, next time that line nine was called, and so this will give us a uh, two one, two two, two three, and then three one, three two, and three three. And then at the very end, we should have a stop iteration when we finish that outermost loop. All right, and again, anytime we're looking at something with a yield, uh, one of the ways for these simple problems um, that you guys can think about this is that this is, I can replace this with a list. And if it's a generator, there might potentially be like a loop that's gonna generate prime numbers forever. And I can just kind of in my brain replace whatever is going on with something that looks like this. All right, let me get rid of those. So the code actually will come up with uh, the matching output. Um, but a generator doesn't have to stop. It can just continuously produce more and more values one at a time. Every time we ask for give me the next value. Um, so this is another way to think about what you know just a mental model for what's going on inside of a generator uh, essentially there you can think about translating them into a list all right um i'm going to delete this i'm going to do another example here i'm just going to say that g is equal to f all right when i do this yeah this looks better um a little more simple okay so I'm defining f here. That's going to be my function. It's a generator um, object. And when I actually use the f with parentheses, this is what's creating an instance of that generator. And I could have more than one instance. I can have, let's see, I need another letter, m equals f, like that. And that will give me another instance. These are the separate pieces. So this is going to use the code up there. The generator instance is going to remember the state of wherever it left off. You know, what's the next line? What are the local variables? Uh, stuff like that. Um, and I can have more than one of those. So they can, uh, this is what was happening in my double loop. I had more than one instance that it really was like hiding from me. So Python Tutor was not giving that to me. Let me go back. I'm going to delete this one. Keep this example simple to start with. Then we'll bring in more complexity. 
So I'm creating a generator instance. And once I have that, there's a special function in Python. It's called next. I can get the first value out of a generator using the next function. Next, and I need to give it the generator instance. And then we'll go ahead and say v1. Um, I'm not going to print that out. We can see right here it's stored the value in the variable v1 in the global frame right here. So this is going to be starting the generator. All right, produces the first value. Then I can do v2 is equal to next g again. This is going to continue. So uh, maybe resume. There we go. Resume the generator, grab the next value. Okay, uh, v3 equals, I think you get the idea. I can keep going. Um, continue to grab values using next. So, take away here. f here is going to be the function object. Uh, g is going to create an instance. Every time I use a generator object with parentheses following it, like a function call, I'm creating a new instance of that generator. Okay. And then here, to get values out, I'm using next. And that's exactly what's happening when I have 4x in, uh, oops, I missed, f, something like this. When I had something like this, this is actually the first time through, creates the generator instance, and then the loop calls next for me. That's hidden. I, to be honest, I'm not sure I've ever really written next. I, I'm sure I have. I don't remember because I always use these in loops. Um, but this is available. This is one of the ways that we can extract data from a generator. And this is what happens inside of this for statement for loop. It's actually calling next for us. It's just hidden. It's, I didn't actually have to write next to make this work. Uh, I didn't have to like come up with a variable name to name the generator instance. All of that's just hidden from me. Python takes care of all the details for me. It makes my life easy. All right, let me just add a little bit more to this. I'm gonna get rid of that loop. I'm going to make this g1, and then we'll have g2 equals a second generator instance. And then I think what I want to do is just print out, and we'll print next g1. There we go. It's going to print one. Print next g g1. Again, that should grab the second one. Print next g2 that will start the next generator the g2 generator and go ahead and grab the first value next g2 that will resume it if i spell things correctly um amazing how picky programmer programming languages are about spelling okay um yeah so it's going to resume grab the second instance we can do print next g uh, g1 that should grab the three. Next, G2. That should grab the other three. Okay, so um, let me rewind a little bit. Go back to the first statement. Uh, here we go. Here's the code for the generator. Remember where it is. G1 is going to create a generator instance uh, and, and assign the variable G1 to that reference. Uh, a reference to that instance. Okay, then we'll do the same thing for G2. At this point, let me just put a note here. No code has run yet. All we've done is create some objects, but we didn't run any of this code. So it's not until we get to right here that we actually run the code. We jump into um, F, so it's creating a frame for F because it is now running the code. It's using the first generator instance and it's going to return one. Print that out. Then again, this is a little deceptive because we're running code for f again. It's a stack frame f, but now it's using uh, this generator instance. So those local variables. That which line did I leave off on? Wait a second. Nope. I'm doing g1 next. I'm on this line. So this is actually the first generator instance, the g1 version. Okay. Now I'm in g2. I misspoke there a moment ago. My bad. Yep, so now we're using this generator instance. That says we start on line one of f, but it's still calling the stack frame over here f because that's the code that's running. All right, I hope that's clear. Um, if you guys need to, we can uh, click through this a few more times. Nope. Uh, go ahead, uh, click through this a few more times on your own. Make sure that this is a, uh, makes sense, that you understand it. 
and then we'll move on. All right, so next up, um, I'm gonna move into the next topic, iterators, generators. Uh, this one's called the scary vocabulary of iteration. It's not really scary. There are just a couple of words that are very similar sounding. Uh, iterator and iterable. Um, I'm gonna do my best to like not slur my pronunciation. And in general, programmers are very bad about using the right term. We're a little sloppy about this one. Um, so I'm going to give you guys some precise definitions, and I'm going to do my best to use the right word. Uh, no guarantees. I'm one of those guys who are a little sloppy when it comes to choosing iterable and iterator. All right, so here's the idea. We're going to start at the bottom, and I'm going to build this uh, flowchart up toward the top of the slide. So when we have some code like for x in and then in something, and we've seen a number of things. We put range here. We put lists here. We've put um, data structures uh, for x in something. Anything that can go here is known as something that is iterable. All right. Um, and here's a bunch of examples of things that are iterable. Sequences are iterable. And once I tell you that sequences are iterable and anything that's iterable can go here, that should tell you guys that things that um, a list is a sequence. A string is a sequence. That means lists can go here. Strings can go here. Tuples can go here. And even range. Ranges are sequences. Um, those can all go in the inbox for a uh, for loop. All right. And now, uh, next little detail, something that's iterable um, can be converted into a list, just like this. Any one of these things these are all iterable because they're sequences which are iterable. Uh, I can stick in the parentheses, uh, inside the parentheses, in a list constructor and create a new list based on any one of these things. Um, and uh, and you, this will generalize as we learn more things that are sequences. Um, that's going to be true. I can always turn them into lists. All right. So. Hopefully by learning this sort of bigger structure, even though there's a lot of arrows here, you guys can now draw conclusions about things you haven't even heard of yet. All right. Other things that are iterable. Um, dict keys, dict values. Um, both of those things, you know, created these dict keys object, dict values object. Um, but these are also iterable. That means we can stick them here and iterate over with a loop like this. And because they're iterable, that means we can turn them into lists. All right. And again, just like this, d.keys uh, grabs the list, um, <clears throat> grabs the, uh, creates the, the dict keys object that um, can be easily turned into a list by just putting this as the parameter in the list constructor, right there like that. All right. So the next vocabulary word is iterator. If something is iterable, then we can create an iterator from it. So, uh, for example, if we have uh, a string like ABC, I can create an iterator with the iter iter function. I'm naming it it over here or it. Um, and an iterator is something that I can call next on. So we just saw that with the, the generators, the functions that had the yield in it. All of those are iterators because they have a next available to them. So uh, are any of these things when we've applied the iter function to create an iterator? So that's just going to basically give us access to a next function that will pull one thing out of a list at a time, or one thing out of a string at a time, or one thing out of a tuple at a time. We can go next, 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 and just grab one piece of that data at a time. And processing data is what this class is all about. So this should be useful. But just vocabulary words. Iterator is what I'm creating. That's the a, a, an object in Python that's going to let me call next to grab the next piece of data. Um, if it's iterable, like any of these things are, then I can create an iterator and then use next to grab more uh, data from it. All right. So let me make this a little bigger now. Three more bubbles. So any function that has the keyword yield in it is going to be a generator. If uh, the function contains that, it's going to be a generator function. Um, generator functions return generator objects or generator instances. 
and generator instances are iterators. So they that means we can apply next to them to get data um, and use that in my code right here. I think I've used all the words correctly and not like misspoken. I'm trying my best, but just be careful. Um, many people, including myself, frequently use generator to refer to both the generator function, that's the code, and the generator object or instance. That's the, like the where we currently are going through the generator. You know, It's going to remember the local variables. It's going to remember the next line to execute. So this is the basically the stack frame object, and this is the code. So, and I'm bad about it. I'm probably never going to get it right again. But for now, generator function, generator object, or instance are going to be separate. Um, and I'm also bad about this one. Uh, generator and iterator are, are basically synonyms. They mean pretty much the same thing. If I have a generator, uh, I can create an iterator. Uh, or a generator is an iterator. That's what I really need. It's right here, is an iterator generator object is an iterator that means that I can call next on a generator object and but some people will use generator as a synonym for other types of iterators like I can take a list here I can use its iterable so I can use iter I-T-E-R on it to create an iterator that's uh, not technically the same thing as a generator um, so it's not directly a synonym um, because it doesn't it's not a function with the keyword yield in it all right, so now some really, really formal definitions to separate iterator and iterable. All right, here's the idea. If x is iterable, then this will work. The iter x. So this is going to return an iterator that goes over whatever x is. So if x is a list, it's going to create an iterator that will let me use next to pull out all this stuff. So if iter works, then this is iterable. Okay. And now, if y is an iterator, then the next will work. So that's really all there is to it. If iter works, it's iterable. If next works, it's an iterator. Formal definition. Also note this connection here, that if I have something that's iterable, iter will return an iterator. And now y is an iterator because it's just been created right there. So this will work. So y is an iterator. Uh, I know that because I just created it, so they're connected right there. All right, so last example for today. I've just got three things here. X is a list, one, two, three. Um, and the, the goal is to say, is this iterable or is this an iterator? So we'll be going over and doing some experiments in a moment. And this next one, Y equals enumerate, given the list, one, two, three. Okay, so w we've never seen this before. This is brand new for... I haven't introduced it in the class anyway, but we now know enough to do an experiment to decide if this, uh, if y, enumerate, um, given the list one, two, three, is an iterator or iterable. So we'll go ahead, we'll do that experiment. And then finally, uh, we'll just test this with uh, z is equal to the uh, decimal literal three. So we'll, we're gonna go try all these out. One sec while I pull up Jupyter Notebook and do this. All right, so I just went and copied that first line of code from the slides. Uh, x is equal to the list 1, 2, 3. And now what I need to know is if it's iterable. So the quick test for that is if I can run iter. And it does. It creates a list iterator. Let's go ahead and save this. it is equal to that. And then we can use this. Um, so it is now an iterator. So we can have next it. And run that cell. It's going to grab the first thing. If we do this again, going to grab the second one, third one. Okay, that's plenty. I, I now know that x is iterable. Um, but now we can check and see if x is an iterator. So we can do, um, we'll grab a value from it. Um, next, x, just like that. Ooh, type error. So apparently it is not an iterator because next only works on iterators. So, in fact, that's the message. List object is not an iterator. So, on an exam coming up, you know, if there's one next week or, you know, a quiz or something, if you're stumped, if you can't remember, um, on your handy-dandy cheat sheet, your notes, wherever you're taking them, jot this down. Uh, if it's iterable, this works, we'll create an iterator. If it's not, 
um, an iterator next will fail list object is not an iterator. you can just do a quick test on the exam and double check for yourself and there might be a whole lot of code you don't need to understand the whole thing to see that the iterator part will fail just need a quick experiment something like this all right um, next up I'm gonna go copy the next example okay I just copied the next example I wanted to make a note real quick right here um, and just note that lists are only um, iterable not iterators okay there we go uh, let's try this one out y equals enumerate we'll just uh, run this real quick there we go and now we can do both of those tests so first up let's try it equals iter of y um, that looks like it worked let me just try out so if this is really an iterator I created it uh, yep looks like it's working it didn't crash or anything uh, we'll explore a little bit more what it's doing in a second but let me go ahead and try the next experiment <laughs> so we'll get a value equals next of y and see if this one gives us an error message no no error message so what is val when we do that again zero one so this is both an iterator and iterable interesting all right let's explore this a little more i'm going to change the contents of my list a little bit i'm going to change these to a b and c because i can see down here that it's giving me more than one number back and my list was one two three so i suspect the a is going to go right here when i run this again yes okay so enumerate is matching up the position of the index here with the uh, the value so it's creating it looks like a tuple let's um let's do a couple more let's do we'll print instead print next y and we'll do it again we got rid of val that's gone so yeah so it's um index zero is a index one is the letter b we do this one more time run that index two is c so again y is both an iterator and iterable i've created uh so i'm using next uh directly on y right here um and now we can also print out it oops next it it looks like i ran out of values so let me get rid of some of these we'll run this again yep so i can use either one i can use the iterator i created with it or i can use the uh, just next function called directly on y run that yep looks like it's working okay let me go double check what my last example was all right z equals three i should have been able to remember that it's been a while though uh at least at least two minutes since i last looked at that okay so here's the idea uh is it iterable okay so if it's iterable then i should be able to create an iterator out of uh, using iterator creation iter okay if that works then it's iterable run that no doesn't look good int object is not iterable all right so that test failed let me go ahead and add another cell we'll get another copy whoops don't do that copy of z right here and now the next thing we want to do is test if it is an iterator so to do that we just have to type next to z and does it give us an error Ooh, yep int object is not an iterator so let me just put that comment right here we'll put this comment right here our error message so all right that's all i'm going to do for today um I got a good feeling that this is pretty close to 50 minutes. We'll come back with files next time. All right, everybody, have a great day.